I'm going to start with a short reading from our UUA resources. This is by Leah Angiri from our Worship Web Library. Here we are, together, each facing our different human task, or maybe the same central one, to embrace the lessons of life that life delivers or discern and respond as we grow, to refuse harm and cherish flourishing. May we know ourselves as vessels of infinite possibility, holders of each other's heartaches and tales of joy alike, weavers of one story in which we each have our part. My name is Rosanna Almai, and I am a member of the board here at QUF. <clears throat> As we gather, I acknowledge that the water, land, and shorelines here in Port Townsend are the traditional territory of the Sklalem and Chimicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous members and neighbors and vow to help restore and sustain these homelands. If you are visiting today, I offer a special welcome and invite you to enjoy, and join us and enjoy refreshments and conversation in the fellowship hall, right down there, after the service. Right at the edge of the fellowship hall, we have a round table that is the newcomer's table next to the patio doors, and there will be greeters there ready to answer any questions you may have. Welcome to you all this morning. We are so glad you're here. And now, for announcements. This is your last chance today to get tickets to see, well, not today, but today is one of your last chances, to get tickets to see, the, um, to come to the 2016 Green Sexuary Echo Hero Award winner, Emil's Revolution, which will be on April 19th. Pat and Sandy, who are Emma's Revolution, are bringing their Raise Your Voice, Get Out the Vote concert to our sanctuary. Let's come together to push back against voter suppression and inspire engagement in this crucial election year where democracy is on the line. All of our voices are needed as we create the country and the world we want to live in. Bring your friends and family for a wonderful night of music and activism. Today, tickets are $20. And if you buy them during the week and the office, they're $20. But if you wait until Friday night, they're $25. Now, this is a fundraiser for them and us. So if you want to wait till Friday night, that's OK. <laughs> but if you want to save a little bit, go ahead and get your tickets today. Just saying. Also, <clears throat> we have our QUF QUF elections coming up to choose new members of the board and the nominating committee and the endowments committee. Members will receive their ballots, you members, will receive your ballots in an email on April 16th, and you will have until April 30th to vote online. Then today at 1130, we have a candidates forum here in the sanctuary so you can get to know the people who are running for these important positions. So please have your coffee and come back and stay and visit with the people who will fill these amazing spots. And now, I think we have one more visit from Chris Flutterson. Yes, she's here. Come on over, Chris. Hello, everyone. This is my final appearance. Uh, I'm your stewardship ambassador, and I have updates. First, Brunchapalooza. The challenge was for us to come together and create a spectacular, spectacular event. I think we passed with flying colors. Yes. Yes. People volunteered with enthusiasm, creativity, and generosity. Delicious food, wonderful music. People came and helped with setup, moving chairs, moving tables, cleaning up, and 
we couldn't cap possibly capture the names of all the people who stepped up. Thank you to everyone who helped to make Bruntapalooza a huge, huge success. I have good news to share. We had a wonderful turnout on Sunday. We celebrated Reverend Linda's 40th year of ministry. Yay. And lots and lots of pledge cards were turned in. Great photos were taken. It was a marvelous event, and the best part was being together having fun. You're probably wondering how the campaign is going. 159 households have pledged a total of, wait for it, $404,000. That amount includes the match challenge dollars. Our goal is $453,000. We're doing great. Thank you again to the generous pool of match challenge donors. Speaking of the match challenge, listen up everyone. I've got important news. The deadline to get pledges in it was April 7th. The pledge increase match challenge was extended for one week. That's tomorrow. All pledge increases that are turned in or postmarked by tomorrow, Monday, April 15th, will qualify for a match. Please get your pledge in. And it's not too late for a one-time contribution. The pledge team and board members will be calling those households that we haven't heard from yet. Calling has already begun. Ideally, you will pledge online or get your pledge in the mail today if you haven't already. We can really help our pledge and finance committees do their work if we get our pledges in by the April 22nd. They need this information so they can craft our budget and for the upcoming fiscal year. Pledging is our opportunity to help build a strong future for QUUF. Remember everyone, the sky's the limit. Say it with me, the sky's the limit. Thank you. So that was some good news, but we still have a little bit of work in front of us. Everybody take a nice deep breath. <sighs> Gently settle your minds so we may begin. Thank you, Ikui. That was awesome. My gosh. I wasn't quite ready for that beauty. Our opening words this morning are by Libby Stoddard. 
We gather together, familiar words to many of us. We, not called here by name, not by special invitation, but we who are here, who, walking by the door, come in, who come anonymously, burdened and borne by our visions and yearnings, our despairs and our solitudes. Gather, called here not by law, not by outer compulsion, but by necessary, by inward necessity, do we come alone or with others, casual but intent, drawing in, drawing toward, drawing near, together, the hardest, the most difficult thing. For within and without this building and this room, we irk, frustrate, anger each other at least as often as we lend or give support. Together is a place, together is a way, together is a focus, an acknowledgement that we who gather here are seekers and are equal in our seeking. It is good to be together this morning. Will you join me in the words for the kindling of our chalice, please? Yes, there they are. O oh, light of life, be kindled again in our hearts as we meet together this morning to celebrate the joy of human community, seeking a wholeness that extends beyond ourselves. Thank you. Our opening hymn this morning is number 308 in the gray hymnal, for those of you who want the, to follow along there, the blessings of the earth and sky. It is our time for all ages, and I invite our children to come up. I'm going to just scooch that back. Thank you. Uh, young at heart, young in body, young in soul. If you just want to come have fun with me. It's a great story this morning. 
great story. Oh, there we go. Hey. Oh, my goodness. Who is that that's coming with you? This beautiful white stuffed animal. My gosh, is that a doggy? Yes. Oh, it's a doggy. And we have a hamster, guinea pig. Man, we have lots of friends coming with us today. So I have a story. It's called Lily's Purple Plastic Purse. Um, and it's written by Kevin Henkes. And it's one of my favorite books. Um, I remember I used to direct a child daycare center, and I used to read this to kids um, back then. So here, let's, let's get started. Lily loved school. I love school, she says. She loved the pointy pencils, she loved the squeaky chalk, and she loved her, the way her boots went clickety-clickety-click down the long, shiny ha uh, ha hallways. Lily loved the privacy of her very own desk. She loved the fish sticks and the chocolate milk every Friday in the lunchroom. I'll note to the adults, I find that one a little unbelievable. <laughs> For any of you who used to have school lunches back in the day? And most of all, she loved her teacher, Mr. Slinger. Yeah, it's easier to see over here if you want to see the book. At home, Lily pretended to be Mr. Slinger. I am the teacher, she told her baby brother. Um, Listen up. Lily even wanted her own set of deluxe picture encyclopedias. What's with Lily, her brother uh, asked her mother. I thought... She wanted to be a surgeon or an ambulance driver or a diva, said her father. It must be because of her new teacher, Mr. Slinger, said her mother. Wow, said her father. That was just about all he could say. Wow. Whenever the students had free time, they were permitted to go to the light bulb lab in the back of the classroom. They expressed their ideas creatively through drawing and writing. Lily went often. She had lots of ideas. Do you all have lots of ideas? Let's hope so, yeah. She drew pictures of Mr. Slinger, and she wrote stories about him, too. During sharing time, sharing time, Lily showed her creations to the entire class. Wow, said Mr. Slinger. That was just about all he could say. Wow. When Mr. Slinger had bus duty, Lily stood in line, even though she didn't ride the bus. Lily raised her hand more than anyone else in the class, even if she didn't know the answer. She volunteered to stay after school and clap erasers. I want to be a teacher when I grow up, said Lily. Excellent choice, said Mr. Singer. On Monday morning, Lily came to school especially happy. She had gone shopping with her Grammy over the weekend. Lily had a new pair of movie star sunglasses, complete with glittery diamonds and a chain like Mr. Slinger's. She had three shiny quarters, and best of all, she had a brand new purple plastic purse that played a jaunty tune when it was opened. <laughs> yeah, adults are seeing the problem here. <laughs> Lily wanted to show everyone. Not now, said Mr. Slinger. Listen to our story. Lily had a hard time of listening. Lily really wanted to show everyone. Not now, said Mr. Slinger. Let's be considerate to our classmates. Lily had a hard time being considerate. Lily really, really wanted to show everyone, not now, said Mr. Slinger. Wait until recess or sharing time. But Lily could not wait. The glasses were so glittery. The quarters were so shiny. And the purse played such nice music, not to mention how excellent it was for storing school supplies. Look! And Lily whispered fiercely, look everyone, look what I've got. Everyone looked, including Mr. Slinger. He was not amused. I'll just keep your things at my desk until the end of the day, said Mr. Slinger. They'll be safe there, and then you can take them home. Lily's stomach lurched. She felt like crying. Her glasses were gone. Her quarters were gone. Her purple plastic purse was gone. Lily longed for her purse all morning. She was even too sad to eat the snack Mr. Slinger served before recess. So sad. That afternoon, Lily went to the light bulb lab. She, lab. she was still very sad, and she thought, and she thought, and she thought, and then she became angry. Hmm. 
She thought and she thought and she thought some more and then she became furious. She thought and she thought and she thought some more and then she drew a picture of Mr. Slinger. Uh-oh. Big, fat, mean, Mr. Stealing teacher. Claws, thief. Wanted by the FBI. I do not want to be a teacher when I grow up. Right before the last bell, Lily sneaked the drawing into Mr. Slinger's book bag. That wasn't a very good idea. <laughs> when all the students were buttoned and zipped and snapped and tied and ready to go home, Mr. Slinger strolled over to Lily and gave her her purple, purse, purple plastic purse back. It's a beautiful purse, said Mr. Slinger. Your quarters are nice and jingly, and those glasses are absolutely fabulous. You may bring them back to school as long as you don't disturb the rest of the class. I do not want to be a teacher when I grow up, Lily said as she marched out of the classroom. On the way home, Lily opened her purse. Her glasses and quarters were inside, and so was a note from Mr. Slinger. It's Mr. Slinger. It said, today was a difficult day. Tomorrow will be better. There was also a small bag of tasty snacks at the bottom of the purse. Lily's stomach lurched. She felt like crying. She felt simply awful. awful. Hmm. Lily ran all the way home and told her mother and father everything. Instead of watching her favorite cartoons, Lily decided to sit in the uncooperative chair. <laughs> Have you ever wanted an uncooperative chair? Anybody? I mean, like for yourself. Um, Lily says, I'll stay here a million years for Mr. Slinger. Why does everything happen to me? 1,051, 1,052, 1,099. That night, Lily drew a picture of Mr. Slinger and wrote a story about him, too. So over here is the picture. So I'm going to read the story first. Lily was really, really sorry. So everyone forgave her, even her parents, even her stinky baby brother, and especially her incredible teacher. And then the sun shined its smiley face down on everyone and everything, and even the bugs and worms. And so Mr. Slinger is saying, listen up, I forgive everyone. Could be principal. I am really, 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 really sorry. Worms, bugs, oops. Um, and she thinks herself an author. So here we go. Lily's mother wrote a note, and Lily's father had baked some tasty snacks for Lily to take to school the next day. I think Mr. Slinger will understand, said Lily's mother. I know he will, said Lily's father. The next morning, Lily got to school early. These are for you, Lily said to Mr. Slinger, because I'm really, 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 sorry. Mr. Slinger read the story, and then he looked at the picture, and then he read the note. Lily wants to know what it said. And then he sampled snacks. Yum, yum. Wow, said Mr. Slinger. That was just about all he could say. Wow. What do you think we should do with this? Asked Mr. Slinger, holding up the other picture. Could we just throw it away? Asked Lily. Excellent idea, said Mr. Slinger. During sharing time, Lily demonstrated the many uses and unique qualities of her purple plastic purse, her shiny quarters, her glittery movie star sunglasses. She did a little performance using them as props. It's called interpretive dance, said Lily. <laughs> Mr. Slinger joined in. Wow, said the entire class. That was just about all they could say. Wow. wow. Well done, y'all. Throughout the rest of the day, Lily's purse and quarters and sunglasses were tucked safely inside her desk. She peeked at them often, but did not disturb a soul. Right before the last bell rang, Mr. Slinger served Lily snacks to everyone's delight. What do you want to be when you grow up? asked Mr. Slinger. A teacher, everyone responded. Lily's response was the loudest. Excellent choice, said Mr. Slinger. As the pupils filed out of the classroom, Lily held her purple plastic purse close to her heart. 
Mr. Slinger was right. It had been a better day. Lily ran and skipped and hopped and flew all the way home. She was so happy. And she really did want to be a teacher when she grew up. That is, when she didn't want to be a dancer or a surgeon or an ambulance driver or a diva or a pilot or a hairdresser or a scuba diver. <laughs> and that's the story of Lily and her purple plastic purse. Thank you guys for listening. Um, it's time for, to sing the children out to their day's activities. Would you please form an arch along the aisle and let's sing them our blessing. We pause for a time for generosity and to receive an offering for Dove House. Kathy Carr, Kathy Carr, a member of the board, will share, that's not Kathy, Ava is going to be here, share a bit about Dove House with us. Thanks. I don't remember your last name. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, not only am I a member here at QUUF, but a board member at Dove House. And I'm very proud to say that because I think they do some great work. Dove House Advocacy Services is the only domestic violence, sexual assault, and crime victim service agency in Jefferson County. So it covers a lot of territory. Dove House supports survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and victims of general crime, and that includes elder abuse. In addition, these victims are sometimes also recovering from life's other challenges, such as mental illness, homelessness, substance use, and other forms of trauma. So our goal is really to empower them. And this is done through education, advocacy, and 24-hour crisis intervention services. We provide individuals and families with a safe place to rebuild their lives in shelter. Currently, housing is much in demand as it is for everyone else in Port Townsend. And we have 18 children in residence with a parent right now. So we are really maxed out in terms of housing. Dove House provides general advocacy, housing assistance, medical and legal advocacy, and prevention services, which are all offered at our community building. All client services are confidential and free, and all are welcome. While helping with these basic needs, we also work in recognizing the ways in which trauma creates barriers to moving ahead with one's life. We provide various resources to build healthy and self-sufficient lives. This creates the possibility for people to begin to hope and dream again. In order to rebuild a life, you need a community. This is why Dove House started the Recovery Cafe, which is just nearby. Recovery Cafe, um, their goal is to create a community-based, warm, beautiful and welcoming space for everyone. At the cafe, we offer free meals, recovery circles, yoga classes, and educational healing classes. Dove House has the belief that everyone is recovering from something. And by building strong bonds and rebuilding our community, we can recover and create a stronger community. We invite you to stop by at the cafe. It's open Tuesday through Fridays from 11 to 4, and lunches are served Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 2. 
and you're welcome to join us for a meal to meet people and see how you can get involved. There is also another new service uh, that Dove House offers. It's called the Dove House Closet. And it's a brand new. Um, anyone can come in for a shopping experience to get clean, like new clothing and accessories free of charge. The closet, which was formerly called New Image, is located just over here in the Mountain View complex. And it's open for shopping or donations Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. Dove House creates all of these wraparound services that are totally free, safe, and without shame, while building a community with positive intentions. All Dove House services are free and only possible because of generous donations from people like you. I'll be in the fellowship hall afterwards, and I will be happy to talk with anybody uh, that has any questions or wants more information about Dove House. Thanks. Um, the ushers will come among you to receive the offering, and additional ways for giving will be projected. Some time. No, not projected. Um, please join me in the offering words. Okay, cool. This fellowship is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it.
It's a good music morning. <laughs> Not that every Sunday isn't a good music morning, but some are just gooder than others. This is, yeah, whew. We set aside time every week to share um, joys and sorrows. And we know that our personal joys and sorrows are only a small fragment of what goes on in the world. And so we begin by placing a rock, a stone today. I just keep being reminded of Warsan Shire's poem, um, what they did last night. At the end of it, she says, last night I sat with an atlas in my hands and I ran my hands over it and I said, where does it hurt? Everywhere, everywhere. In particular today, I am mindful of the ongoing, um, the ongoing terror of the Middle East and what's happening there. Uh, I invite us all just to take a breath for peacefulness, sending that vibe out as far as we can. And in the congregation, Christina asks us to light a chalice, or chalice, a candle for her mom, Jennifer Brink, who has been a member of QUUF since 2010 and has chosen to start, start hospice care this week. That's related to a severe neurodegenerative disorder. So we light a candle and send her and her family love and care and support and hope that it helps ease her suffering. And we place a final stone holding in our hearts these joys and sorrows and also acknowledging those joys and sorrows which are held but unspoken. Thank you. You can sit down. It's Christina's first time doing this. She's doing a great job, isn't she? <laughs> Our meditation today is a, a, is a song. And if you want to look in the teal hymnal, you can uh, look there. But it's, it's pretty easy. So it's 1031. And it's the song, uh, May I Be Filled with Loving Kindness. Are you all familiar with this? Have you all sung this before? A couple of folks. So... Um, it's the metta meditation, right? The Buddhist meditation in which we invite loving kindness um, into ourselves and then we invite um, loving kindness to another and then we invite loving kindness to the world. And um, we're going to sing it together um, as you figure out the words. The words are going to come up, right, Gary? Are we going to get the words up there? Yes? No? Yes? Look. He's so good. Um, as you get familiar with it, uh, with the tune and with the words, because it just we just we're just going to replace one word each time um, through. I invite you to close your eyes and just sit back and try to exude this loving kindness out into the world. I don't know if it helps, but I know it doesn't hurt, and I know that it also can change our hearts. So, um, Nikue, will you play through it once and then we'll begin.
Amen. Both of our readings come today from Repentance and Repair, Making Amends in an Unapologetic World by Rabbi Dania Rutenberg. Our first reading. According to Maimonides, a person doesn't just get to mess up Mumble, uh, mumble sorry and get on with it. They're not entitled to forgiveness if they haven't done the work of repair. And they're not necessarily entitled to forgiveness even if they have. Another human being's suffering is not magically erased because the person who caused it says they didn't mean to do it. This is true in our personal lives it's also true of politicians caught saying racist things, celebrities named as sexual abusers, human resource departments that cover up employee complaints, complaints and governments perpetuating harm against individuals or groups. Fixing damage involves steps, taking specific steps. There is a process. We can never undo what happened, but we can transform the situation and ourselves. But you can't cut corners. There ends our first reading. From the same uh, book, Repentance and Repair, Making Amends in an Unapologetic World. It's impossible to talk about crime and punishment and consequences and accountability and repentance without talking about the larger systems in which people are embedded. We do not cause harm in isolation. We cannot be held accountable in isolation. And we cannot do the hard, hard work of repentance, transformation, and change in isolation. Judge Joseph flies away, former chief judge for the, excuse me if I say this wrong, Hugh Alapai Tribal Court in Arizona, says that in his community, when a person commits a criminal act, people say he acts like he has no relatives. Flies away regards the law as a tool not to punish, but rather to bring people back into their communal context to help them heal. He notes, People do the worst things when they have no ties to people. Tribal court systems are a tool to make people connect again.
So I wonder, do any of you select a word for the year? Anybody out there select a word for the year that you kind of follow with? Ooh, boy, not what you'd call a big practice in this community, but that's okay. I usually um, forget about doing that. And, um, y you know, those of you who are doing that have been, you know, several months into working on it. Um, or, you know, perhaps you have already forgotten what your word was. That often happens to me. Um, so, but I've discovered over years that eventually the word appears for me. It takes me a while to figure out what it is. I'll stumble on it sometime in the midst of the year. And this year, it seems that, um, it seems that, that I've finally gotten, um, uh, well, I'll say, before I say that, I'll, I'll say that sometimes I don't find it until someone reminds me that I am saying something for the like 18th time and even telling the exact same story from my life about it. Um, and I go, oh, wait, wait, maybe, huh, huh, maybe I need to be paying attention to that. Um, so this year I found it. Um, uh, I found it. It's only halfway through April. I take that as a victory. Um, and I figured out, as I was reflecting upon this, I realized that it's probably been my year, my word for more than, uh, than this. It's probably been my word since September. Um, when I look back over what I've been preaching about and the kind of work that I've been doing and the messages that I've offered one place and another, um, my word should have been easily apparent to me because it just keeps coming up. And the word is interdependence. I preached about it a few weeks ago. And when I was, you know, I'm supposed to make these blurbs for all the sermons so that people have an idea of what it is I'm going to say. Um, the only thing I could come up with was relationship, relationship, relationship. That's the theme. And it's, it's, a, it's a happy thing that the common read for the UUA this year lifts it up again, though not in the way that we typically think about interdependence. But it is relationship. It is that connectivity that is at the heart and the core of the stellar book, Repentance and Repair, by Rabbi Dania Rutenberg. She starts with a basic premise, one that we can all understand. We hurt each other. It's a part of the, our human condition. We are awkward creatures, you know, prone to all sorts of missteps, mistakes, and blindnesses. Our capacity to misunderstand, misinterpret, and ignore what's going on around us is limitless. Can I get an amen? amen. Right, folks? and our sense of self-protection is so strong. And as the saying goes, denial is not just a river in Egypt, right? <laughs> that we get along at all seems sometimes to be just a pure miracle because we know we harm people. We do it, and we ourselves are harmed. It's what happens when you have people and when that happens, we need a way to name it. I'm going to take these off because they keep clicking. We find a way to, need to find a way to name it. And for those who have been harmed and those who have been harmed, to address it. And it is perhaps needless to say that most of us aren't very good at doing that, even when our intentions and our hopes and our um, what we want to be in the world, when all of that is good, we're still not very good at it. Moses Maimonides, a 12th century philosopher and scholar, outlined a process for working through the harm we do and the harm we receive. Rabbi Rutenberg has brought that process into the present to help us in this century find ways to create greater wholeness and healing in the world. I commend the reading of the book to each of you and hope that what I share today can serve as an enticement for you to read it and get a fuller understanding as this is a bit of a mad dash um, through what is a deep and thorough exploration of Maimonides' work. When we have been harmed, Maimonides cites 
Leviticus and urges us to rebuke the one who has caused harm. Um, Rabbi Rutenberg softens that a little bit. That rebuked word is a little scary, I think. She says, if someone harms you, you must tell them so that you don't nurse the grudge or feel consumed by resentment. You must tell the person. You must take action on it. Because we human beings, let me just, in case you hadn't noticed, we can be so oblivious. It's not one of our better features, but it is absolutely a part of who we are. Our capacity for denial and blindness is seemingly unlimited. And given the opportunity to make things right, it is possible to make a path through. And one path is the one that Maimonides outlines for the one who caused harm. And this is what that process looks like. Starts with naming and owning the harm, starting to change, restitution and accepting consequences, apology, and then finally making different choices. This present process doesn't start the way that most of us have gone about responding to harm we've caused. Our initial uh, instinct is almost always to apologize first, right? We are trained to do that. Any of you who have had kids or worked with kids, um, who hasn't, who among us in, that, in, in, uh, in those situations haven't demanded of a child that they say sorry when they've said, taken someone's toy or said something mean? I ran a daycare center. I know that child. I know that one. I have done it. Who among us hasn't begrudgingly muttered those words while nurturing a sense of injustice that what we did wasn't all that bad, damn it? <laughs> right? Right? We're stubborn people. We protect our sense of ourselves as good, well-meaning, as maybe klutzy, but not the sort of person who would do something bad. So the, the process doesn't start with an apology. Rather, it starts with a thoughtful acknowledgement of what happened that focuses on the impact, not on the intention or the thoughtlessness that enabled it. It's worth noting that this isn't meant to be simply a statement between two people, but is best done in the context of a wider community because there are often public dimensions to what happened. Rabbi Rutenberg offers some examples, quoting her, uh, quoting her, quoting someone, um, someone saying, it isn't okay that I told that joke in staff meeting. I didn't realize at the time, but now I understand that it was really transphobic. That should be shared, not just with another person, but with all the people who were in staff meeting, even if only one person has come to say it was a problem. An acknowledgement of harm has to be followed by the work to change, step two. Quoting the rabbi again, true repentance happens at that moment when a person comes into a similar situation to the one in which they'd previously committed harm, and this time they do it right. It is soul work to create this kind of change and to do it differently next time. And it isn't easy, you all know this, it isn't easy to take up the work of change. Someone said um, that the only ones who like change are wet babies, right? Have you, I, I think I've mentioned this before. I got it out of some book uh, from somebody uh, years and years ago. And those of us who have been around wet babies know that not even all of them want change. Can, right? Right? Parents out there, people who've taken care of kids, you know this is kids. They will walk around in a poopy diaper forever before they let you change it. For each of us, the work of change will take different paths. For some of us, it'll be prayer and meditation. Others will seek therapy. We'll work on practicing humility and avoiding those situations where harm could happen again. It is intentional, focused work to be different. 
The third step is restitution and accepting consequences. What is needed to make this right? This is tailored to the harm done. The person who made the transphobic joke, perhaps they offer financial support, significant financial support, to a local organization that supports trans folk. Not just a $25 check, but an amount that counts, perhaps even over time. Restitution is not a simple gesture. Finally, at the fourth step comes the possibility of apology. And this is where my word of the year gets its moment. The apology must be offered in relationship with the person who has been harmed. A real apology, Rutenberg tells us, is not aimed at the person, but rather given in relationship to them. The apology isn't aimed at the person, but rather given in relationship with them. It is vulnerable to step into that space. It demands sincere regret and sorrow. And it is always up to the harmed person to decide if forgiveness is even possible. And it isn't always. You know that. Some ways, forgiveness isn't even the point. The fifth step in this is to make different choices in the future that the kind of harm that has happened is not repeated. That the world is just that tiny bit better because this change has occurred. See, while the point of all of this is for the harmed person to be cared for, that person is the focus of the whole process and deserves um, uh, um, uh, 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 amends and restitution if that applies. But the end result and the power of the process is that there is less harm in the world overall. When we risk speaking aloud what has happened to us, when we drop our shields and listen carefully, we are changed. And as each person is changed, so does the world change. It changes because we are interconnected, interdependent, related to each other. And in these brief remarks today, I've been focusing on the individual, but <clears throat> let me just say, as you read the book, notice I didn't say if, <laughs> right? You, are are y'all getting this message? When you read the book, you'll find that this kind of process can be used in communities, in countries, in any situation where harm happens and is responded to with care. The ultimate benefit is not only to the ones harmed, but to the wider world as we do what we can, where we can, as we help each other grow and change. This is, this is a profound way to bless the world, even in the small moments where a wound is tended, where a heart is changed, and when a new path is sought. It is the work in our hands every day, every time. We see harm, we cause harm, we are harmed. It is in our hands to build the world back better with love and care. So may it be. Amen. Our closing song is, look at me being so brilliant that I close everything and don't even have an order service up here. Our last song is Creative Love, um, Our Thanks We Give. If you read music, the tune we're using is different to the one that's in the book. So, but Doug will ably lead us through. <laughs> Let's sing together. <laughs> Thank you.
Creative love, our thanks we give that this our world is incomplete, that struggles, greets our will to live, that work awaits our hands and feet, that we are not yet fully wise. That we are in the making still As friends who share one enterprise And strive to blend with nature's will What could the future long delay And still with faults we take seated. A quick benediction from Philip Giles. May the quality of our lives be our benediction, the blessing to all whom we touch. So may it be with us today and in the days to come until we are together again. Let us extinguish our chalice. We extinguish our flame but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.